Uh, what are you seeing and hearing from others about, about the challenges they're facing? Just give everyone here a general sense. Um, you know, because most folks, unless you've worked in a warehouse, you, you don't know. You read the stories, you hear a little bit about it. But give us kind of your perspective and take, uh, both of you, a little bit on, on what that's like. Um, can you hear me? Um, Closer. There we go. Oh, we got you there. So I worked in a warehouse and um, most of my career basically. Uh, medical devices as well as, you know, just packaging day-to-day -day things from Walmart, I guess you can say. Um, been a delivery driver since 2008. Um, sometimes the conditions can be variable depending on the weather. At times it's a lot of pressure that we get to deliver the packages on time. Um, inside the warehouse, you have to work as a team, get things done. As a driver, you have to depend on your on the route that was designated to you uh, without all, with the knowledge area that you get with the time that you have already delivering. Um, days are long, it's very physical uh, work, especially in the warehouse, and at times it's mentally exhausting, especially when management push pressure on you to work faster. One thing they do push is expect the unexpected. It's, it's thrown out by management, yet not considered when real-time delay occurs. It causes a lot of stress on our us as drivers. I used to work three jobs until three years ago, but now I can support my family with just one job as a UPS driver because of our union contract. <laughs> Even though I work long hours at UPS, at least I don't have to stress about holding on to three jobs all, all at once, you know. Get time to be with my family now. So maybe so, like on that point, like, because I, I think this gets lost a little bit, like you have delivery schedules and that's like what Google Maps or someone maybe says in ideal conditions it is, but like then you have things entirely outside of your control and then you get held accountable for that, right? I mean, yes. So uh, we have commit times of 8.30, 10.30 and 12. Uh, next day air, early a.m. and early a.m. I mean, well, next day air for residential areas. Um, if you're late on a package, it's on you. They, won't, they don't care about any excuses, whether it was traffic, uh, car broke down on the freeway, you know, things like that do happen day to day, not every day, not everywhere, but you're still held responsible for the time because that's losing the profits. Yeah. Sean, anything you wanna, wanna add in there? So what yeah. you're hearing from folks out there? Yeah, so um, I would reiterate that this is, you know, extremely physical and skilled work. Uh, Nathan, you talked about uh, Amazon having kind of three to four times the injury rates of the rest of the industry. A lot of that's because they're constantly bringing in new people, churning <laughs> through uh, workers and, you know, not providing people the proper training, support, uh, to do this job safely and <clears throat> we're really seeing in a lot of the industry a model that's dependent on just turning through people and it doesn't provide a, a life of stability security um, not only for that worker but for their family right John talks about working three jobs juggling the responsibilities of having three jobs even if the hours only add up to 60 you know, which is what he's working now as a UPS driver, the, 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 the struggle of, of juggling all that um, really takes a toll on you. In the vast majority of this industry, wages are extremely low, um, especially for, you know, considering how uh, difficult uh, these jobs are on, on, on the body. Um, and there's <clears throat> a real problem, and I think this policy is gonna really try to get at this, there's a real problem with uh, what we call a contingent and a fragmented workforce. So one contingent just meaning that there's no security. Um, if workers speak up to try to demand better, it's very risky for them. And workers still do that all over the country. You know, we see stories of Amazon workers taking action. We see other workers uh, stepping up and taking risks. Um, but in this industry in particular, uh, the, the lack of connection to the employer through temp agencies, um, and then the fragmented workforce. That means, you know, a lot of workers that are doing the same work or you know have the same job. You would you would see them as all being part of one group, but they actually have different employers. So 
when one group of workers you know tries to demand better of their employer they point to you know the amazon or the the, the bigger company and say oh well we can't make those changes because they won't let us um, and if they try to make those changes, then the big company comes in and says, oh, you're not being productive enough or efficient enough, we're gonna get rid of you. So it's a really difficult environment for workers to stand up for themselves. And despite that, they're doing it, but a policy like this is really gonna help bolster workers' ability to assert their rights. Thank you, thank you for sharing your stories uh, with all of us. Um, Sherry, you have been leading researcher rights since 1980 particularly uh, leading the Warehouse Worker Resource Center. Um, can you share a little bit with all of us a little, um, about uh, what's been happening in the Inland Empire regarding warehouses and why we have seen this lucrative growth in the industry in the past decade? Yeah, so, um, so I've been working with warehouse workers in the Inland Empire since 2008 um, and First, I just want to congratulate you all on having this conversation at all. Congratulate your board on, on thinking about these things. If we'd been having these conversations in the Inland Empire in the late 90s, um, the situation that I'm about to describe to you might not be what it is. Right now, um, the Inland Empire, Riverside, San Bernardino counties, is one of the biggest clusters of goods movement in the world. Um, has well over um, 300 major warehouses with uh, hundreds of thousands of workers working every day bringing us goods and the jobs like Sean just said aren't very good um, I run a worker center we support workers to have just basic um, living conditions health and safety conditions make sure that the companies are paying minimum wage um, just you know basic kind of standards why are we doing that because the standards are so low even though these are some of the biggest companies in the world Amazon Walmart are at the same time that they're making huge profits also have some of these worst conditions. Why is that? It's because we don't have standards. These companies depend hugely on the Inland Empire and increasingly on, on San Diego County for their distribution of their goods. We know that, right? We know that they're making huge amounts of profits. Companies like Amazon made record profits over the pandemic and ex expanded greatly. And that's at the, you know, at the cost of the workers because, like Sean said, they churn through people. Um, they have, so, you know, some companies like Amazon just burn through people, others use a lot of staffing agencies, independent contractors, all these different tools to keep workers from having a stable work, working conditions, also to keep it from, keep workers from being able to organize and unionize, right? So what we see in the Inland Empire is possibly your future if you don't do something about it, right? When I, um, I went down to Ote Mesa today to drive around. Um, I hadn't been there in a few years, and it has grown quite a bit in the last couple of years since I was there last. I checked out the Amazon facilities. It looks a lot like what we have in the Inland Empire. But what, you do, what, you, what we don't have is what you guys are talking about, a path to a standard that can apply to the, to the region in a major way, a, set, a comprehensive plan, um, a set of standards that you can apply, learning from the lessons that we've experienced in the Inland Empire, the folks have experienced in the Central Valley. Um, the key thing to remember is these guys need you as much or more than they, you need them, right? This is a huge market with the two million people in San Diego. It's a huge you know, border cross, three million, right? It's a huge border, border crossing, a huge uh, part of the, you know, the, the global system. They need that, that region, they need this region in order to operate at the, at the scale they want to or to profit at the scale that they are. And to, all we're asking for here are some basic standards, right? Basic stability, um, basic conditions where workers know what they're, um, what they're gonna expect for, for their work week, um, protections around health and safety, protections around their contingency. And those are things that, again, if, if we'd been able to, to pull together for, for our region, um, we wouldn't have the kind of race to the bottom that we currently have in, in our region, where one city will have a warehouse with certain standards, and another city will offer something, offer, offer a subsidy to that warehouse next door to come over, right? And they'll say, well, we'll do it for cheaper, we'll do it for better, we'll give you an extra subsidy, we won't watch you as closely. And so we have this, you know, virtuous, we have this uh, race to the bottom that's, that keeps reducing the conditions, and we have to kind of clean up after it um, through organizing, through advocacy through uh, you know enforcement 
And so again, if, if a policy like what's being considered here, um, you could kind of go in the other direction. Say, we're gonna raise standards, we're gonna say, this is a set the standards for San Diego, and you actually set the standard for the rest of us in the state. So we're calling on you all to lead us across the state. People across the, the state are, are dealing with warehousing expansion, um, Ventura County, the Central Valley, the Bay Area. Um, you guys are in a position to, to really change the game and set a standard that is both appropriate and also totally doable for these companies that make a ton of money and um, really, you know, are positioned to, to do the right thing if we force them to. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Woo. We're going to Dr. Green. So Dr. Green, you have been working with our office for quite a bit, helping us kind of shape and, and put the pieces here together. Uh, but maybe share a little, like, it's not just an economic justice issue, and it's not just an environmental justice issue, it, it's also a racial justice issue. Um, and maybe share your overall kind of take and perspective on all the different things that, that this uh, encapsulates. I just want to start by saying that, uh, you know, I love being a San Diego. And looking across this room is why we do this work. I look out, and this room looks like San Diego to me. It has the racial diversity and the gender diversity of our region. It is a beautiful space. And part of working on this type of policy is about, number one, standing up for workers. That is what you are hearing here. I want you to understand that the industry that we're facing um, will exploit people. It will make the richest people, Jeff Bezos, made a fortune during COVID. And then I want you to understand the wages that were being paid to workers during that same period of time. Half of all warehouse workers, people working in warehouses, transportation, and utility sector in this county make less than $17.32 an hour. Now in some other parts of the country, people might think that's a lot of money, but that equals less than, that's $36,000 a year or less to survive in San Diego County. There's no way that people can make ends meet. And that's the high end of the median for this area, for this uh, area of work. So for instance, if we look at hand packers and packaging work, half of those workers, and they make up 10% of the industry, they make $14.50 an hour or less. In fact, they've created a whole category of workers just to talk about this rise in e-commerce. E this is stockers and order fillers. Those folks make $16.15 or less an hour. So we're facing, when we talk about economic justice, we're not talking about just on the edge of it. We're talking about poverty jobs, jobs that do not allow people to survive in this region. And we know how expensive it is. The other thing about work, the work that we do at CPA is that we recognize that all workers, the system is designed to exploit all workers. But where companies can have the biggest advantage is where there are workers of color. There is real, the history of racism and discrimination among workers in this country is real and alive and present in this industry. And that's why it's important to recognize that Latinx workers make up 35% of the people in this industry in San Diego County. And black representation in the industry is twice the average of the county as a whole. So black folks make up about 6% of the population, but 11% of the people who work in this industry. So that's why you're going to hear a lot of people tell you, contrary to what Sean said, they're gonna say the opposite. They're gonna claim that this is unskilled work, that people are easily replaced. And I wanna tell you two things about that. Number one, it's not true. It's highly technical work. It's important that people are skilled and trained and able to survive in it. But the other thing is that when we stand up for policy like this, we're saying that every San Diegan is valuable, their labor is valuable, no person is simply replaceable, their jobs are not places that should be allowed to break their bodies, steal their time from their families, steal their wages, and then tell us that we're lucky to have those jobs. They're lucky to have us, and we're gonna set higher standards yeah. to the Can you tell us um, why why do you think uh, organizing warehouses, warehouse workers, is going to be the next big fight in the labor movement? Um, you know, we've seen some of the challenges you know that people are going through to be able to go against these companies. So can you talk a little bit about that? I think you touched upon it at the beginning, but if you can like really go into it, so that you can share with all of us. Um. Well. well I'm gonna have to read this off because I 
know how to type it out beforehand. You're all great. Yeah, you're all good. First time, okay? Uh, well, Let's give him a hand. Yeah. With rising inflation and first step to stabilizing the local economy, we have to hold accountable companies that export their employees in factory and unions, and we can actually have a better understanding of who's in it for profit. Um, most of the time, the companies don't understand that their own employees are also their own their consumers. When we have to work along, when we have to work long hours, we we're removed from our families just to make ends meet. So, why are we going to put more time into? You know, our hours of work and neglect our family. That's kind of how we have separation of families that are pretty much going up now. So just personal thing. Thank you. <laughs> so, Kira touched on uh, Jeff Bezos, and one thing that <clears throat> I go around the, the region and talk to our members about the, the threat of companies like Amazon and how they're driving down wages and standards. And, and <clears throat> one stat that we always throw out, and I could be getting it wrong, because his, you know, how rich he is varies <laughs> every day, you know, by a couple billion dollars here and there, but I think the stat is that how much money that Jeff Bezos and one individual made just during the first two years of the pandemic, he could give every worker in Amazon they're the second largest employer in the country, second largest private employer. You give every worker $100,000 and still be richer than he was before the pandemic. So that's the kind of wealth that we're talking about here, is companies have the ability to treat people correctly. So that's an opportunity, right? Making it clear <laughs> who is making money off, off the backs of people like John, um, off the backs of the brother here uh, who works at, at U.S. Foods, um, and drawing that distinction. Another opportunity, you know, that I think is really important for us to keep in mind when we do start dealing with some of the people who are going to say, oh, no, we can't afford to do that, or we're going to drive away jobs, e-commerce has created a dynamic where warehouses are having to be located closer and closer to where population centers are. I promise you, if they could put the warehouses that they're building in Otay Mesa or Miramar, if they could put them in the IE, they would, because the land's cheaper and there's a lot more people to go work at those warehouses. They have, if they're locating in San Diego County, it's because they have to. And that's an opportunity. Like Shahariar said, they need us more than we need them. And I would say that, you know, lastly, I think as a, as a society, we better get ahead of this issue. We saw during the pandemic, and we're still dealing with the impacts of supply chain disruption. A lot of that has to do with this contingent workforce, people not being glued to their employer, to the operation, not being taken care of. And ultimately, yeah, that's gonna impact the rest of us. So, you know, we have an opportunity in this county to somewhat get ahead of this issue. And if we, if we don't, workers are gonna to have to continue to increasingly take matters into their own hands. And, and that means strikes, disruptions, all kinds of stuff that we're, we're, that we're seeing a little bit now. As a county, we have an, an opportunity to get ahead of that, protect workers and protect our economy uh, in the process. I just thank you so much for your answer. But can you talk a little bit more about how hard it is to organize in, in some of these? Because I'm, I'm assuming that if you have to be, you know, you have to deliver something by a certain time, and you have three jobs, right? And somebody's trying to get a hold of you and try to get you to organize. Can you talk a little bit about that? How tough it is to really organize sometimes? Because I think that's something that I think folks would like to hear about. You want the organization for the day to day or? So, I'll, and I'll call on you to talk about your experience a little bit, but um, yeah, I mean, I, look, in this country, we spend so much time working that it's really hard to think about other things, <laughs> like, you know, 
organizing with your coworkers, dealing with all the dynamics, interpersonal stuff to try to make things better. It's really hard, it's a lot of work, it's really risky. Um, but I do think a couple of the things I want to just reiterate, and John has some experience with this, but um, <clears throat> when you, you know, this, this country we have laws that protect workers' right to organize a union, come together with their coworkers to demand better. But that faces the tough reality that, work, that laws that protect workers typically aren't enforced as well as laws that protect property and other things. So um, you've got schemes like temporary agencies, which John has an experience working under a temp agency where you had to, you wanna talk about it? Oh yeah. Just real quick on the meeting. So there's some companies that will contract you out for work. So let's say you get contracted out for a biomedical company, which is the rising in Sorrento Valley. Um, your contracts are usually 13 months, which is the longest that they could actually exceed. Um, after that, if the company wants you, they have to have a three month, uh, three month grace period in order to actually buy you out. If they decide to keep you before the contract expires, then they have to pay a finder's fee of finding you work, but not to you, to the to the um, staffing company. So percentage of your pay rate is not actually going to you, it's going to the staffing agency. So that's money out of your pocket to, to begin with. So that, you know, that makes it a lot harder for people to come together. You're constantly distracted, discombobulated, you don't know who you work for. Um, and then another thing that companies do, and Amazon does this with the delivery drivers. So everybody seen the prime vans in their neighborhoods, right? Yeah. Usually like a few of them <laughs> around every corner. Uh, John, before he was a UPS driver, uh, drove for Amazon. And those, none of those drivers are actually Amazon employees. They wear Amazon vest, they drive an Amazon van, but they work for these delivery service partners. And so anytime that a group of those drivers that work for the one company, if they start raising hell and try to you know, demand better, and that company agrees that to a 50 cent raise, what does Amazon do? They say, oh, well, you're not as efficient, so we're gonna cut you out, we're gonna cut your route. So Amazon has all these tools in the, in, in the toolbox, and these companies have all these tools to try to just keep workers from being able to to codify any gains that they, that they make. So to expand, to expand on that is that uh, within Amazon itself, the distribution center, you could have multiple companies that are gonna be delivering for them as well as their own personnel. So you could have like companies like OnTrack, um, I, I don't know, what's it called? There's like a few other ones. Um, they could actually hire the employee, they're in charge of the, they're contracted out with the, with the routes. They're in charge of hiring the employee, the benefits and everything else. If something happens between Amazon and said employer, then that's it. The employee can be you know, out of a job, even though they just started. And so what happens to that employee? Like, do they still stay with Amazon? Or is Amazon able to retain them? Who knows? So it leaves them uncertain on what their future can be if that's the career path they want to choose. So, Harry, you, you've had experience in the same thing, right? The work you've done trying to organize. I mean, what are your perspectives on what what it takes for a successful organizing drive, and then any perspectives again on some of the additional challenges? Yeah. So, over the last ten years, we've. Um, they get organized in a lot of uh, major warehouses, including some some Walmart warehouses, some Amazon warehouses, and what, um, but not in the context of uh, union, or union organizing, but in the context of just raising standards to a basic standard. I think that's the that's the thing. Is like we're starting already underground. We're starting in a hole, trying to dig up to just a basic level, even though we're up against some of the biggest companies in the world. So. What, we, what we've come across is wage theft leading to workers working on a piece rate, sometimes dealing with workers getting two or three dollars an hour. This was 10 years ago and that was even, you know, um, piece rate was a really, really common thing in, in warehousing. Um, workers, again, employed through staffing agencies that, you know, took a lot, of, a lot of their wages from them. So organizing around those issues, getting that basic kind of standard up to, you know, basic minimum wage or above 
getting rid of the staffing agency through direct action, through organizing, through litigation, just to get to the level of you know your average worker, let alone the unionized worker. So I think what, what I want to tell you guys about is that the kind of policy you guys are talking about today would raise that standard initially, right? Would keep you from being in, keep our workers from being in that hole initially, and would make it easier for those workers to organize um, from a basic living standard up to something that potentially could be a union. Um, so I think that's the, the main thing is in organizing workers who are temps, it's totally possible to work, organize workers who are temps. Organizing workers who are really contingent in an Amazon context, we have a group of workers we're supporting at an Amazon facility in San Bernardino. They did a walkout about a month ago. They're organizing really strongly. They did a bunch of delegations last week around the heat. But it's, it's, a, you know, it's, it's really a grind, right? Every day they have to get out there and fight just for those basic conditions. Um, and that's, that's what we're talking about right now. Raising the standards through a policy like this would give those folks a little bit of a step up, a little bit better, closer path to a basic standard so that when they organize, it'll get even higher, right? So, um, so that's basically what we're thinking about is, you know, what can we do to, to raise the floor so that everybody's working from, from something a little bit more, more equitable, something a little bit fairer. So we're not dealing with wage theft. We're not dealing with just egregious health and safety standards, but we're working from a, a basic floor that, that workers, if they want to then unionize from, it'll be a little bit simpler. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Green, I know that we've been organizing and working with your, your team at CPI, Environmental Health Coalition, Teamsters 542, and the Power Switch Action. Can you talk a little bit about the board letter and some of the, um, what's what's in the actual gist of what we're trying to introduce here and, and what you've heard from you? Uh, sure, thank you. I, I wanna start by saying, I wanna talk about the parts of the policy, but I also don't wanna miss this opportunity to say to the folks that what we need each of you to do, we can put all the best policy together, these folks can pass it, they do that all the time, they stand up for folks, but this is going to be a real fight. And to fight for the things that I'm about to describe to you is important for a, for a couple reasons. One, when Shahariar was talking about the work that's happening in the IE, when we set strong policy in a region, we inspire people, other people, to take a stand. And when we don't pass strong policy, when we back down, it discourages people. It undermines that hard work that goes into organizing people, getting them to be brave. And that's what these companies want. They want to say, the people in your community don't support you. They don't want you to have these standards. They want they want their cheap goods and they will sell you out for them. And so that's the real call for every one of us to support this policy, to show up, bring friends. I'm proud to be here in San Diego with San Diegans who know how to organize. So you know you're gonna have to bring yourself and you're gonna have to bring your best friend and you're gonna have to bring the neighbors. You're gonna have to bring a lot of people because that we've seen in this country that these companies, the thing that they're best at innovating is they're best at telling us lies and taking away rights. We all saw that happen in the state of California with Prop 22, where they came and promised that they were gonna improve wages and standards for workers, but really it was a ballot initiative about taking things away. So we have to be an informed, active, involved set of folks fighting for the policies that are right. But let's talk about what goes into these policies. First of all, it's about raising the actual wages in this industry. So we're gonna start out by talking about a wage of $25 an hour in this industry. Wow. Yes. I'm talking about that number, and I wanna give this to you because it is the amount of money, according to the Economic Policy Institute, that a single person needs in San Diego just to support themselves. So each worker needs to make at least $25 an hour just to provide their, for their own basic needs. That should be the minimum in this industry. We also want to make sure what companies will do is then they'll force people to work to these quotas that are already body breaking and they'll push them to work even harder. So what we want to put into this policy is a requirement that if people exceed the quotas, then they will get paid time and a half. Yes. Yeah, right. What we ultimately want to do in all honesty is not encourage people to work to these body breaking quotas. We want to change the calculation of these companies so that they will hire more people instead of breaking the people they have. Yeah. We know that it's not
not just about the just about the money that people put in their pockets. I'm talking to you about the bodies that are being broken every day in these warehouses. This is a, this is dangerous to people's short term and their long term health. So we want to make sure that that's there. To help improve that, it's not enough just to monitor it. We know things that we can do to improve the quality of air inside the facilities and in the surrounding communities. All over San Diego, where things are being transported, there are children around these warehouses growing up with some of the worst air quality in the state. We can do something about that by using electric vehicles inside the facilities and getting rid of toxins yes. that are happening in the air inside and by creating charging infrastructure around the facilities Woo! so that the vehicles that come and go will be cleaner and safer for San Diegans. <laughs> One of the things that I really love about this policy is also looking at scheduling. People who work every day are part, are deeply part of their communities. They are the heart and the soul. They're the people who watch out for the children in the community. They take care of the elders. These are important people, but you can't do that if you have three jobs and you don't know when you're going to be home. When you don't know if you're gonna be able to pick your kids up from school or take your parents to a doctor's appointment. So we want people to have fair schedules. This is something that these companies can do because they have the algorithm that can force them, that can tell them how many packages they can move. Certainly they can produce a schedule that's two weeks in advance and notify people of changes in that schedule. That is something they are capable of and they don't do it, why? Because we don't make them. And that's what we're going to change. So what I know about this policy is that it is going to be the policy that sets the standard in this, in this state and in this country. We're going to do something that is not being done anywhere else because we as San Diegans can inspire people to be better, do better, be stronger. I know that about us. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Green. You know, the scheduling issue, I mean, part of it is to keep them fragmented, keep them disjointed, uh, but part of it's just that lack of recognition of the humanity of folks, you know? I mean, think about how hard it is to arrange your child care and who's picking up and dropping off and going to school. I mean, all of the things, and Dr. Green makes a great point, like they can literally tell you what day, like to the hour you can get what package, but they can't, they can't manage to schedule their workers in advance. And it's, it's not that they can't, it's that they don't want to. Can one of you real quick, and then we'll open up to questions from the audience, but can, can you all, whoever, whoever wants to join in, open question, kind of walk through this, this quota per piece type system. You know, I've read a lot about it where you know, you have to move so many things in such a finite amount of time, and if you don't, you get written up and you get fired. And, and you know, I remember reading a really exhaustive thing where they'll say, "Well, we have these safety standards, and we trained them on the safety standards, but if they use the safety standards, they can't humanly make the quota. And if they don't make the quota, then they get fired, and then we wonder why they're not, you know." And and so maybe just kind of describe and, and talk about it, and even how. When they've been able to introduce robots into facilities, it makes it worse for workers. And you know, one of the things we'll hear when we do this is, so if you do this, then we're, we're gonna have replace every worker with a robot. If they could do that now, they would. <laughs> I mean, come on. Yeah. I mean, if they could do it now, they would have already done it, right? The workers that are there, because they have to have workers you know, that are there. But whoever wants to, just kind of jump in and just give a, a sense when we're talking about these quotas and performance metrics, what that, what that translates to, to workers. Yeah, I mean, I think um, Amazon has the most kind of robust and clearly cut um, quotas. They're, they call it rate, but a lot of other a lot of the other warehouses are starting to adopt that same model because it does move people very fast. Um, and so, basically, workers are assigned a rate to do the the tasks. There's a lot of different tasks in every warehouse, um, whether it's walking down a corridor and picking a certain product, and you have a certain number of seconds to do so or moving a certain box and you're supposed to look at it a certain number of angles um, per minute, per hour. Um, and usually what, that, what, what you see is the, the same different problems that manifest in any workplace manifest through, through the rate, through the use of this quota. A quota is a tool to push workers, but it's also every other tool of exploitation is used, with, the quota is used to, to exacerbate that. So as an example, if you're if you're working, you have to move at a certain pace, and you're not able to keep up. Maybe it might be related to your age, right? It might be related to some disability or some um, restriction that you have. But like, 
like you said, there's um, a certain level where if you if you go below that rate, you do potentially get written up. If that happens enough times, you do potentially get fired, right? So there's a kind of core of a discrimination basis in a rate of a certain pace. That's why Amazon, a lot of these companies try to aim for really young workers and try to move them really fast. What if you get hurt? Then obviously you're gonna slow down. And if you try to keep powering through that rate, that injury will get exacerbated, right? You'll probably maybe do some other kind of compensating injury because you're skipping steps because you're moving so fast. So the injury rates, the, 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 the injuries that you see at an Amazon facility are core, at, at their core tied to that rate, tied to people <coughs> rushing. What if you're running, right? If you're running, you're not paying as much attention. You might trip, you might bump into some of that machinery that you mentioned, right? The more catastrophic injuries that come from those kinds of things, um, broken, in, broken legs, those kinds of things come because people are rushing, they're not paying attention, you might bump into something. So all the different problems that you see um, in a warehouse, discrimination, right? Not everyone gets written up for that rate violation, but people of color, women, are gonna more likely to be written up. Those kinds of d discrimination, those kinds of prejudices that exist in a, in a manager, it's, you're not being fired by the robot, you're being fired by a manager who says, oh, here's my chance, here's my ability, I can give, you, I can give them a reason for um, terminating this person because they didn't make their rate, and they do it very selectively based on who they wanna pick off, the person who's organizing, the person who speaks up, the person who's pregnant, right? So again, like, it's not the robot, right? That's what I really emphasize that's doing. It's not the computer, it's asshole, pres it's asshole managers who are making the same moves, but they're, they're hiding behind a computer, right? And so that's kind of the way that it manifests in these systems. Um, and then finally, you mentioned the, the robotics. A lot of the time, the robotics actually force you to keep up. So if you're, you're not, it's not just a robot, it's a, a rack that moves, and you have to keep up with that rack and, and load it. And if you don't load it in time, it's gonna move on, it might you know, bump into you. So again, the, the machinery is used as a tool to, to move people at a, at a rate that is unhealthy. So all of these things are things that, um, are you know a machine version of what we deal with in humans all the time, um, but again it's a you know it's it's a machine so you can hide behind it. What we want to do is demystify that, remind people that there's a human behind the algorithm, that people are designing these systems, and in fact the data that comes back to Amazon and Google companies should, tells them very clearly what's working, what's not, and what they want to push on. So that's that's the way these systems work, and what I would say is by having a policy that goes directly at that, um, that would be a groundbreaking step. That's the kind of thing that ha isn't happening. And if it doesn't, if it isn't caught in the warehousing, you're gonna start seeing it in grocery stores. We are starting to see it in grocery stores. You're gonna start seeing it um, in hospitality. You're gonna start seeing it in all these other sectors and we're not gonna have a plan for it. Just to add to that story, um, in 2019, uh, we were part of a, a group of organizations that did the initial uh, study of Amazon injury rates. And um, every year, I think starting in 2017, the injury rates were getting worse and worse and worse. And they actually went down in 2020 because the company suspended rate to try to comply with some of the social distancing requirements during COVID. Now, they already had this big you know, PR machine ready to be like, oh yeah, we're instituting all these safety measures, which you know, usually safety measures is just you know a way to punish people like Sherry or said, but it was literally because they spent a rate because when they reinstituted rate, the injury rates went right back up to where they were before. So this you know the issues are are, are completely tied together, and just to speak in in a, uh, about the piece rate issue, um, you know in a in a lot of you know especially grocery warehouses, uh, so U.S. Food, Cisco food warehouses. Um, and then, you know, up in the Inland Empire where we have Kroger, Albertsons, um, and Stater Brothers grocery warehouses, uh, we have a, a group of workers that are contracted out called uh, lumper services. So these workers unload the deliveries that come into the warehouse, and often those folks are actually working at a straight piece rate. So they'll run, I mean, like a bat out of hell, and they'll make, you know, decent money but you can't do it for more than you know, a year or two. Like it really breaks your body down.